to get it sound good when people are back and then just do the messages he said you know he said because people can go on any station Good morning. Thank you for that opening, Sarah. I'd like to welcome you to Community Baptist Facebook live service. I'm going to start things out with a few announcements. I'm going to do prayer requests, open us in a word of prayer, then I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, Mason, and Ann. They'll be singing this morning. Just a reminder, we do have Facebook Live tonight. That'll be at 6 o'clock. Wednesday night, we have Facebook Live. That'll be at 7. Now, no matter what, starting next Sunday, Facebook Live will continue to run, but we're going to open up our service next Sunday morning. But we're going to have a few rules as you come in next week. Per the governor's order, until it changes, we're going to ask that when you come in the building, you have masks coming in and going out. Once you sit in the building um, with your family, you may take that off. But going in and going out, we're going to ask you to keep on the mask. Just a reminder, we will not be taking up an offering. The offering will be, um, there will be a box. As you come in the door, you can drop it in the box at the back. Um, There will be no Sunday school. There will be no nursery. There will be no children's church. Um, If you need to use the nursery, if you're going to change a baby or feed a baby, that is perfectly fine. But other than that, we're asking the nursery not to be used. If you are not feeling well, we're asking that you stay at home. Uh, We're going to take temperatures at the door. Any temperatures over 100, we're going to ask you to go back home. We're asking you to bring your own chair. If you don't have a chair, we will have chairs out, but I want you to know we're going to use the chairs that are in the fellowship hall, the white ones, um, the hard ones. That way we can clean those very easy, so we will have those available if you do not have a chair. When the service is over, we're asking for no fellowship. We're asking you to go back outside, um, outside, and then I think that's about it. But if you have any questions, you can call JR this week, you can call Chris this week, or you can call me this week. But we're going to try to open up next Sunday morning at 1030 for a 1030 service. And then that will include on Sunday night and Wednesday night if you would like to come. But we will be in the gym at that time. All right, prayer request. We need to pray for the Ben Smith family. Vicki Elder, Joseph Kaczewski, Joe, this is uh, Debbie Hodges' daughter-in-law, Tommy Taylor, Perry Lyle, Mark Phelps, in our country. And I'm going to open this to the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for today. Lord, I want to thank you, Lord, for another opportunity you had to be in your house. Lord, I want to thank you for the technology that we have, that even though we're not in church, that we can have still have services. Lord, we want to thank you for all the hard work that's gone into um, all the technology and all the um, things to work on Facebook. Lord, we want to thank you for all the singers that have worked hard and that have been here faithfully each week to sing your praises. Lord, pray for all the ones on our prayer request list, Lord, the ones that are still battling this virus, Lord, the, bat- the ones that are battling um, cancers, Lord, the ones that have had surgery this week, Lord, be with them. Lord, for the ones that are expecting, Lord, be with them as well. Lord, pray for Chris today. Give him the words we need to hear. Lord, we want you to know we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. secret 
shame you set me free perfect love my fear was stolen when thou my Jesus died for me by the cross of Jesus Christ every sin was bought at the highest price every fear was lost sin erased when Jesus took the cross he took my place all my heart I lay before thee to sound the depths of love divine so free so infinitely of Jesus Christ every sin was bought at the highest price every fear was lost every sin erased when Jesus took the cross he took my place by the cross of Jesus Christ every sin was bought
Before we even sing the next song, I was thinking to myself, and when we were trying to get these songs in which order we were going to sing them, and we chose it this order because it just paints a picture. I mean, it was by the cross that we were saved if you put your faith in Christ and what he did on the cross. And then we say, thank you, God, for saving me. And then we go to this next song, and we just sing out such an awesome God. He is so glorious and so awesome. The song says, that such an awesome God, so mighty, so holy, so wonderful, such an awesome God, so selfless, so generous, so faithful you are. And I think about Philippians 2, where he disrobed himself and became man on our behalf. And that is the God that we serve. And that is why we can stand and sing each and every Sunday and each and every day of our lives that he is an awesome God. Listen to this song. Jesus. Uh-huh. 
Father God, we thank you. We praise you, God. God, for not only being selfless, for not only being generous, but God, for remaining faithful each and every day. Lord, we praise you for this. You are an awesome God, and we serve you. Lord, I pray for Chris. I pray that you would hide him behind the cross. God, give him the words to speak, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, it is good to see you here this morning. Thank you so much for that. Beautiful, beautiful singing uh, this morning, and a lot of Uh, Hours of practice goes into making uh, that harmony sound so good. We appreciate you guys being patient with us as we're trying to uh, remain safe and uh, as we come back together and we're thankful for um, all the hard work put into this. And so just uh, heed to what's been put on Facebook and also what Anthony said this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 25, Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 14. Now, the, uh, the interesting thing about the, today's message is this, is that we talked about the ten virgins last week, and five of them who had oil, five of them who did not, the oil being a representation of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at today how this parable actually piggybacks off of that ten, the ten virgins. And so we're going to talk about what the representation of the kingdom is. And so, Matthew chapter 24, uh, I, okay, all right. We're trying to forward it here. I'm not able to do that, but maybe I'll get some help from Tyler and see if we can help me. In Matthew chapter 25, actually, verses 14 through 30, we're going to look at all these verses. It's quite a bit of verses, but uh, we're going to move through some of them a little bit quicker uh, than others. Don't forget, this is still Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse. And the discourse is simply to run away with the conversation. And don't forget the reason for this. And and I've used this introduction since the beginning of Matthew chapter 24. The reason for uh, Matthew 24 and 25 was because of one question. And the question was this. The question was back in verse 3. And he was sitting on the Mount of Olives. And the disciples came to him privately and saying, When will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming? When will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming? This is the questions that were asked to him. What is he talking about? When is your kingdom coming back in? It's amazing how much the Old Testament is a reference to the the second coming of Jesus Christ when the Old Testament um, uh, writers are writing about this. It's it's amazing how many times the disciples is not referring to the rapture at all because remember, the church was a mystery. Paul talks about this. They didn't even know the church was going to come into existence. They thought Jesus Christ was coming back and establish his kingdom right here on earth immediately. That's why they were singing Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Uh, on that Monday when he rode in uh, on that donkey. And so they were, they were waving the palm trees. And so we see here that um, they were referring to this. And then when he didn't establish his kingdom here on earth, all of a sudden what happened? Everybody left him. Everybody left him. So as this is the whole part of this. Now, in just a quick review, the Matthew 24, remember, we're going to stay within the context, and there's a lot of people that try to get out of the context in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. But remember, Matthew 24, we're talking about the tribulation uh, written to the Jews here, the Jews, and also middle of tribulation, the last half of the tribulation. We talked about the end of the tribulation, and then the second coming of Jesus Christ. And this is where um, I have I struggle with some of the, the commentaries. They jump from the second coming 
back to the rapture. And so we talked about the fig tree and how it was a representation of um, the harvest of the second coming. And it doesn't represent when Israel became a nation in 1948. And so we looked at that. And we talked about the timing of the second coming and one taken and one left. And the one left is the one that's going to be left here on earth to be ushered into the thousand year reign. The, the one taken is going to be the one taken to hell. It's going to be killed. And so uh, make sure you stay with the context in, in every passage that you're looking here. Last week, we talked about the readiness for the waiting. We talked about the ten virgins, five of them who had oil and five of them who did not. And so therefore, this is what he's doing today. When he's using the parable today, and he's talking about the ones with the five talents, the two talents, and the one talent, he's actually referencing back, he's tying these two stories together. And that's what I want to do today is talking about using your talents and what that looks like to those. Now, here's the issue. We have a ton of freeloaders, do we not? We have a lot of freeloaders in society. We have freeloaders in the local church that are simply piggybacking off of other people's work. We have a lot of people who will be glad to sit back and let and, and enjoy what's going on in the local churches or in our government as long as other people do the work. You know, it's often been said 80% of the people don't do the work or piggyback off of those 20% who actually are doing the work. And so that's what we want to look at today. What does it mean to be a freeloader? What does it mean in, in this parable of the talents? What does it look like to be a freeloader? Now, if I just had a simple definition of freeloading, it would simply be this, taking advantage of another person's generosity without giving anything in return. Nothing wrong with a person being generous to you, but also know this, it's just like in a marriage or any relationship, there is a give and there is a take. Yes, Christ is giving us all these things, but he also, you know, he wants to reciprocate that and he wants to be given back too, you know, just because he's given to us, we also ought to give back to him. And so we're going to see examples of freeloaders. I've just jotted some down. It's probably people who are not paying rent, you know. And the government has set it up where oftentimes those who own the house actually um, lose, uh, lose more than those who are living in that house. And so people say, well, I'm not paying rent because I know the law and the law is for those. And I understand there are situations where you have hard landlords and they can just think they can come in at any time of the night or day and just get them out. And that was a protection thing. But we have those and people who call themselves believers who are not paying rent. And, he's, and you're just freeloading. You're living off of the landlord there. And, and now they have to go through the court system, cost them thousands of dollars. And oftentimes people ruin the houses and all that. How about adults that are still living at home? Uh, that, are, that are very capable of working and capable of, 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 of helping with their parents or whatnot, not that they have to be out on their own, but they're still living off of mom and dad. They're expecting mom and dad to continue to support them. How about billionaires who are, just don't want to pay their taxes and, and, they, and they want to, they, they're billionaires because of how they found out how to go through the loopholes of the system. How about politicians that are getting rich off of trade deals? It's, it's no excuse unless they've inherited the money where politicians are worth $240 million and $250 million, as you see, and, and it's because of some of the trade deals that they've done that's benefited them, and they've forgotten that you are, you are for the people. You are, you are speaking for the people, not for yourself. They're freeloading off the people. Not only this, what about people that are living off of welfare? Who can really go to work? I talk to business owners who say that they are calling their people back in to come to work, and they're saying, no, I'm making more right now off of off of uh, uh, not making, not uh, bringing in a paycheck, um, and so, and I'm not going to come back to work, you know, and people living off uh, welfare that can go to work, and so if you can go to work, your work has invited you back in, you need to go to work, you need to, you need to get in the job force, and you need to not freeload off of the taxpayers. Not only this, what about professing Christians that refuse to work to get into the kingdom, or to, not that you have to work to get into the kingdom, but refuse to to work for the kingdom now what does that look like how many times people say well i'm retired and because you're retired you retire from church work you retire from working for christ you retire you're retired and you're not doing anything for the kingdom of god this is what this is about they stop their working and using their talents for the lord because they decide i'm tired 
I often see where people are very happy to sit and listen to other people sing and work. And they're often very thankful to sing about heaven and going home. But you're not home yet. It's great to look towards that. But I want to tell you, it's very important that you get to work and stop sitting on a pew or sitting in your house and refusing to work for the kingdom. It's time to get to work and stop freeloading. And by the way, is this... Does this happen in the scriptures? Absolutely. When, when new believers got saved in Thessalonians, what happened was they began to sit down and not do anyone, anything. In fact, the Bible says if anyone is not willing to work, it's not, they're not capable to, capable to work, they're not able to work, it says they're not willing to work. These are people who can. And then he's very clear, then you should not have anything to eat. Boy, that's totally different than what our society teaches. But he was saying, if you're not going to work and you're not doing your part and you stop freeloading off of who? The church? Other believers? The government? He said, stop freeloading. And he says, because if you're not willing to work when you're able to work, he says, then you should not be able to eat anything either. And he says, and what this leads to in verse 11 is an undisciplined life, doing uh, no work at all because you start acting like busybodies. You know what? You know, he's talking about the idle hands makes the devil's workshop. That's what he's referring to there. He's talking about because then they're in everybody else's business. He says, he says, get to work because then it, you start leaving yourself into sin and different things. He said, but in this case, they were in everybody's business because they were not going to work and they were and they refused to work. And he says, and by the way, eat your own bread. He says, you should be going to work. He said, eat your own bread. Stop constantly going to other people in their house and, and, and trying to get food off of them. He says, eat your own bread. Those that are capable. By the way, there's a system set up for this in the scriptures, helping the widows. And by the way, the families help them first. And then the church comes in. And there's a system for this and what that looks like. And an age of a widow that it should actually be. I mean, God has already set all this up. And then, then he says, do not grow weary in well-doing. Continue, continue, continue to use the works, the talents that God has given you. Because there is a reason that he gave these to you now let's begin in verse 14 he says now this is coming from the 10 virgins if you haven't seen that sermon you need to watch that and then you'll understand he says for it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them and he says for it now what is it the it is the kingdom of heaven. There's actually two parts to the kingdom of heaven. It's not talking about the thousand-year reign. And we see this multiple times in Matthew. If you've been keeping up with these, I've referred to the kingdom many times. There is two types of, 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 of kingdoms here. There's an inward sign that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. By the way, wasn't this the ten virgins? Five of them who were, five of them who were not. And so the N-word was the Holy Spirit. You know what? Five of them had the Holy Spirit. Five of them did not. It was a representation of the inward. But in this case, it was the outward sign of those who are actually believers. It's those who are an outward sign. And so what we're going to find is those who are using their talents and gifts for the Lord, we're going to see that this is a sign that they're really in the kingdom of God. We're going to see what you do here on earth is a reflection of who you really are. If you really have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Because, you know, people say, well, well, God really wouldn't send people to hell. God really wouldn't do that. And you're right. God does not. People make that choice to, to reject Jesus Christ. And so even people sitting in the churches all over today, you know what? You're going to find that there's going to be a many of them who will never enter into the kingdom. And, and you think about a situation like this with the slave owners. I thought about this pandemic. You know what it's going to reveal? It's going to reveal who are truly believers. You know, people say all the time, well, I'm scared. I'm scared of who people are just not going to come back to church. People are not going to come back to church. They're going to get out of the habit. I want to say this, that if you're a real true believer in Jesus Christ, you're not going to forsake gathering around the Word of God. It's just not going to happen. That you're going to want to be around other believers. You know what? You know what this pandemic is going to reveal? It's going to reveal, just like in the last two, it's going to reveal who are truly believers. And the ten virgins, you look at the, they were all dressed the same. They all had their torches. They all had their lighters. They were ready to go, but five of them didn't have at all and you know what revealed when it was time 
to enter into that wedding, when the bridegroom came, you know what was revealed? Who had the oil and who did not? If you were to look at all ten virgins lined up in a row, you would think, wow, they're all getting into the kingdom. But that was not the case at all. And so what this is revealing, the three slaves here that we're going to look at, we're going to see it revealed who's entering into the kingdom and who is not. And so let's look. A man is going on a journey. So this is the master. And, and this seems to reveal after the rapture of the church and we're going into the tribulation, a man went on a journey. The master represents Jesus Christ here. And he went for an extended period of time. So in this case, it would be about seven years long, 2,595 days, give or take. And he called his slaves, and this is those who belong to Jesus Christ, is a representation of who we are, okay? And now, if you look at the four different types of slaves during this time, which was what we're going to do, he also refers them to a bondservant. Now, every slave wasn't on the same level. Every slave had different talents and abilities. And so that's what I want to reveal to you. Just like in this church, you know, I, if you take me and Mason— Mason and I will never sing exactly the same. You know, he will never have my voice. And he thanks the Lord for that. And there's going to be talents and gifts that I have that he will never have. And God has given us all different talents and abilities. You know, I may play the piano better than Sarah, but, you know, she's learning. She's learning. And so we're going to look here at the four different types of bond servants and the four different types of, of slaves. And it, and it also represent types of four different types of slaves that I believe that we have and, and the different gifts and talents, okay? Okay. First of all, there was this a common slave laborer. All right, those are people who work around the property, that did yard work, that planted flowers, that took care of all these different items. And by the way, was every slave important? Was it important that the grounds was taken care of? Absolutely. And then you had the menial house, household slaves, those who dusted, those who vacuumed, those who cleaned, those who made sure things were taken care of, those clothes that are washed. Can you imagine removing the menial household slaves? Imagine no more washing, no more clean clothes. Can you imagine what the house would look like? Does it make them less valuable because they were simply a household slave? Absolutely not. And then you had a skilled craftsman that had been given the abilities here. And, the, and these people were really highly trained. They understood how to make furniture or they understood how to do different things with their hands that our other people just did not have that ability. And God had given them this ability to, craft, to be a craftsman. And so, by the way, we have people uh, all around us that have certain abilities that other people do not have. And then you had the overseers. Now, these were sort of like the slaves that were trusted above all overs. Like when the property manager left, the master left, they could say, call in these overseers and say, look, Here's the thing. I'm leaving. I need you to take care of the place. These are the people that if you're a boss, you can walk out of your company and pull your managers or your overseers and say, look, I need you to take care of the business while I'm gone. And you can walk away knowing that they're going to treat it just like it's their own. And that's what the overseers were. So look at the four different types of slaves we have here. By the way, who's more important than the other? It's not talking about who's more important. What's it talking about? Who has more, what, ability in each area? It's not talking about more important than the other. It's just that some people's been given more responsibility than other people have. And that's the same way in life. You know what? There are people with four master's degree and three earned doctorates behind their names. I never forget that one of the speakers they brought into Pensacola and they put his name up there. And that's exactly what it was. It was three masters and four earned doctorate. There were so many um, there were so many letters behind his name, I thought they couldn't even fit them on the screen. You know what? There's going to be people like that that have been given that responsibility and they are taking on and they understand, they have a knowledge of the Scripture, they are very well studied, and then you have somebody that opens up the Scripture and it can barely read. You know what? There's been one responsibility here, one responsibility here. You know what? One person is not less than the other. It's just been the gifts or talents that have been given different you know what god is not equal when he gave gifts and talents and abilities and and where he placed you he put you in the field that he's at to be used and he's given you the ability and the gifts and the talents to be able to to work in that environment so now let's look here he says 
He says, and he entrusted him. So this master had three overseers. And so back on, back on track here, we're back on the highway. Now we're, he had been given three trusted overseers, and he called them in, and he says, look, I'm going away, and, and, and he, I'm going to entrust you with my property while I am gone. And here's what he said here. He says, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to give one of you five talents, <clears throat> and I'm going to give another one two talents, and another one won, and each according to his what? His own ability. So he didn't give the one with the least amount of ability five talents because he knew he wouldn't be able to handle that. And so he gave each one his own ability, and then he left on his journey. Let's look at a talent. A talent is simply, this is a money by representation of weight. The more weight that that money had, the more that it was worth. By the way, if you look back in Luke, he talks about the talents here. These are not the same parables as the one in Luke that he told several days earlier. So know this, this is a totally different uh, uh, here uh, uh, parable. Now, when he says weight, you think about if you pick up gold. True gold is very heavy, right? And so the most value because of the weight is gold. you got silver that's not as valuable as gold. It's going to have a less weight. And then you have bronze that's going to be even far least valuable than those two. And it has the least amount of weight here. And so he's doing it. I'm giving you so much weight, okay, based upon your ability. And then the determining factor by who got what, like I already said, was their ability. How are they going to handle certain things? It's just like in your, in your house. If you, you wouldn't leave and go on a week's vacation with your spouse and have a five-year-old and a six-year-old and say, y'all make sure you take care of the house. And you make sure everything's okay when I get back. Because what? They can't handle that responsibility. They're not ready for that yet. And so this is what he's doing. He says the ability was how they handled things around the property. How he had already watched and he saw, I know this person can do this. And this was, he already showed from the past what they could actually do. All right, now let's continue on. So immediately, I love this, immediately the one that had been given five talents, he, uh, he had received the five talents and he went and traded them. You know what? He didn't waste any time. And I think this shows the responsibility of the one who had five talents. He showed that he could handle this. In fact, he says, there's no time to waste. I've been given all this responsibility. I've got all these doctorates. I've got all the master's degrees. Or I've got all this education. Or I've got all this physical ability. And I need to use this for the Lord. And so they wasted. He wasted no time in order to be able to start using this. And he gave him five talents. Meaning he is the one that received the greatest amount of weight. You know, if, if, if I can handle the weight, then God's going to put the weight on me. He's only going to put the amount of weight on me that I'm able to handle. But by the way, I think sometimes that we put more weight on ourselves than what God is putting on us. And we take on more things than what he is putting on us. So remember that too. And then he says he traded with them. Now, it doesn't mean that he ran down to the local market and he traded five talents and, 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 and he, we're going to see that he doubled those. But it seems over a long period of time, he began to, to, um, to add weight to the amount of talents that he had. And he says, and the Bible says in the last part of that verse, and he gained five more talents. Meaning this, very simple. He was faithful to what God had given him and what God had already given him physically, mentally, and he doubled what the master had given him. He took five talents and he turned it into ten. So he was faithful. And that's what God is requiring here, is it not? Faithfulness. To what he has already given you. And that's why there's no room for freeloaders in the church or in society, in your home, because somebody is going to have to take up the responsibility that was once yours. There's a great illustration used how kids would leave their towels in the floor and parents would say, you know what, I've done this with my kids. Say, I just want you to know that I'm going to pick up that towel because you chose not to do it. And so what you said was, Dad, Mom, I don't want to pick up this towel. And I don't want to hold on the responsibility that was really mine. I want somebody else to take on this responsibility. And for a child, they're like, no, 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 I'll get it, I'll get it. No, no, 
I'll take care of it. Because you said, I don't want to handle the responsibility. It was really mine. And this is exactly what this man says. Look, this is my responsibility. He gave me five talents. He gave me this weight. I've been given the responsibility to take and earn more talents for this master. Same way in the church. God's given you responsibility. He's given you the ability mentally, whatever that might be. Not one is less important than the other, but he's given you different gifts. He's given you different talents. And what are you doing with what he's given you? In verse 17, in the same manner, the one who had received two talents. Now we go down to the one. We left the one that had five. Very simple. In the same manner, just like the previous slave, the one who had two talents is smaller Amount than the first. By the way, is one slave more important than the other? No. Just more could handle the ability, had the ability, the responsibility to take on more weight. And different people have, can take on different weight. That's all it's saying. And he gained two more. You know what he did? He was faithful. He was faithful. He doubled the amount that was given to him over a long period of time, whatever that might have been. However they did that, that's not important. But they were simply faithful in what God had given them. And that's what we want to be focused on. Am I being faithful in what God has given me in the talents and the physical abilities that he's given me, the spiritual gifts that he's given me? Am I being faithful with those things to give them back to the Lord. Because I don't know what we're waiting on. And I don't know what we're holding out for. And I don't know what we're trying to rest up for. Because when Jesus comes back or he takes us home, whatever that would be, we should be completely spent out and have nothing. As Paul says, I was poured out. I don't have anything else to give. What are you saving yourself for? What are you holding on to? You know what you're revealing is that it could be like the ten virgins. You really don't have the Holy Spirit. That if you're not going to be faithful to what God has given you. And, and so that's what we're going to see here next. Now let's look. But he who received the one talent. He who received the one talent. So we have five, two, and now the person received one. You know what? This person was, was not any less important than the others. He received one talent because, and it was the least amount of weight, it would be the bronze, so to speak. It was the least amount of weight simply because he, the, the slave owner had looked and said, you know what, this is what you can handle. Some of you are going to be able to handle five talents. Some of you are going to be able to handle two talents. And some of you can only handle one talent. But guess what? You're all equally important to the kingdom. And you all have been placed in a field in the kingdom. And the field that you've been placed at is where God placed you and gave you the ability to serve in that manner. You know what we learn? Just because you have one talent or you have five talent, the same amount of faithfulness is required from all the slaves. By, well, how do people complain? Well, I don't have this ability. Well, I don't have this memory. You know what? I'm just not a good reader, so therefore, well, I'm just not a teacher. I can't give the gospel because I don't have the gift of evangelism. I can't serve in a church because I, I can't do nothing. You know what? God has given you different gifts and abilities and talents. And he says, you, you may not have as many as the next person, but the same amount of faithfulness is required. Now, let's continue on. So what did he do? Because he was given one talent, he dug a hole in the ground, and he hid the money. He placed it in the ground. By the way, placing money in the ground has been practiced for thousands and thousands of years. You know, I think people after 2008, I think they wanted to go bury their money because of what the banks did. We know at the Great Depression, people took their money and, and they buried it. And there's probably money still buried today in mason jars all over America because people do not trust banks. People don't trust banks today. And so that's been practiced. The, the, the simply the reason for burying the money was for safety. So you say, Chris, well, didn't they have banks? And, and they do. They did have banks. And I wanna, I'm going to talk about that. Let's go to verse 19. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled the accounts with them. So by the way, after a long time, the master was gone. I think it showed the trust that he had. It showed that he was probably very wealthy. It showed that, it showed that you know what, I can leave my property and I can leave it up to these overseers and I know that they're going to take care of everything. He said, after a long time, and 
if Jesus has been gone for a long time and he's going to come back for the second coming, nobody knows when his return. You know what the neat thing is? The master did not send text. He did not send a picture. He did not make a phone call. It was, it was impossible for him to do that because of technology or lack of. Nobody knows, we've already discussed this, when the return of the master is going to be. And when he's coming back, he's coming to settle an account. And so the first order of the business was this, is have you been faithful? And he calls them into his office. He calls them into his, his room of whatever. And he says, we need to settle what you did with what I gave you. In verse 20. And the one who would receive the five talents came up. And he brought five more talents, saying, Master, you've entrusted five talents to me, and I want you to see what I've gained. So he says, you entrusted me. You know, the, the talents given were not to begin with, but was from his master. Believers need to inventory what's been entrusted. And this is what he's saying. Look, you gave me five. I want to ask you this. Do you know what your gifts are? Do you know what your talents are? There's plenty of stuff online about the, the spiritual gift survey and figuring out what that is. Man, I've taught classes on it. Did you need to know what your gifts are, what your talents are? Because here's the problem. People say, well, I just don't know. So that gives me the excuse because I'm not willing to search it out. I'm going to freeload off of other people and I'm not going to do my part and I'm going to expect the 20% to say, hey, I'll pick up your towel for you. And he's saying this. I know my inventory. I know what you gave me, and I know what my responsibility was. Despite if anybody else around me is doing it or not, I know what my responsibility was. And he says, I have gained five talents. By the way, some people say, well, he's just bragging. No, he was just stating a fact. You gave me five, and I've gained five. I've worked hard. I, I appreciated how you gave me the responsibility to be able to oversee the weight that you gave me, and I've doubled that weight. By the way, remember this. Who gave him the initial five talents? Did he earn them? Did he come up with them? Did he pull them out of his pocket? Who gave him the talents? The master did. Who gave you your gifts? Who gave you your ability? Who gave you what you have? The master did. So if, you, if the master is giving you these things, then why are we using it for the world? Oftentimes, I, I think of this story. My mom told me this story of something that happened in a church, and, and the man who played the piano every Sunday, work started interfering with that, and he started working every Sunday morning, Sunday, on Wednesday night, and then Sunday night, and Sunday morning. And, and while he was at work, it took about a year, I believe, and, and the man's hands were crushed at work. And you know what happened? He lost the use of his hands completely. He never played the piano again. You know what? The master is the one who gave everybody, believer or unbeliever, he gave you your gifts and your abilities. But he also can take those things away. What are you doing with these things? This, this, this guy wasn't bragging. How do you brag on, hey, I got five talents to start with. He had zero to start with, and the master gave him the five talents, and it was his responsibility to take and turn those five talents in to five more. And so his master said unto him, Well done. Boy, I tell you what, we all want to hear this. Good and faithful servant, right? You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge over many. Enter into the joys of your master. You said you were faithful in the few things. Even though this slave was granted the most, it was in no comparison of what he was getting ready to be in charge of in the millennial kingdom. He says, what we're in charge of right now is small in comparison of what he is going to put us in charge of. And what we do now with the gifts and the talents that he's given us is going to matter in the millennial reign. It's going to matter. And then he says, enter into the joy of your master enter into this relationship of that reveals what we have now because of what you did with what i gave you enter into the joys of the lord can you imagine just doing what god has given you he's not saying giving me a hundred and ten percent i know my wife hates that statement and she has preached it to me so much i understand what she's saying and i now hate it how can you give a hundred and ten percent 
There's no possible way that a coach can say, give me 110%. There's, you cannot give 10% more. Give 100%. You know what Jesus is saying? Don't give me 110%. Just give back what I've given you. Give me 100%. And this is what all this was asked to do. He says, enter into the joy, the, the relationship that you have now with the Father and the joy that you have on earth and also in the millennial reign and in heaven is, is actually looking back, what did you do with what he's given you here? And also the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted me with two talents. See that I have gained two more. The entrust with two talents, just like the first, they took inventory of the mount. And he says, look, I've doubled in which what you gave me. I didn't do this on my own. You gave this to me and you expected me to use it to benefit you and the kingdom. Verse 23, his master said to him, well done, that good and faithful servant. You are faithful with few things and I'm going to put you in charge of many. Welcome to the joys of your master. Well done. The two, two words that every believer wants to hear. How in the world are you going to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, if you continue to sit on a pew, if you continue to sit and do nothing and not use the talents and gifts that God has given you? You know what? You're not going to hear those words because you're not going to enter in the kingdom of heaven. And I'm getting ready to prove that. He says, I'm going to put you in charge over much. The reward was the same. The reward was the same. Listen, I'm going to give you much more responsibility in the millennial. And this is about faithfulness and what they had done. And then the one who had received the one talent came to him. You know, he's watching this and he's scared. Because the master's come back and he realized that he did not take the responsibility that he was supposed to take. I knew you were to be a hard man. Reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. Wow. You know what the first thing he did? He began to blame shift and say, let me, let me, well, before we begin, this is your fault. This is your fault because you're a hard man. This is how he started the conversation. Master, you know what he was saying here? You are my God. Lord, Lord. What does Jesus say? Everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord, will not necessarily enter into the kingdom of heaven. Pastors will not necessarily enter into the kingdom of heaven. Singers will not necessarily enter into the kingdom of heaven. People who sat on a pew will not necessarily enter into the kingdom of heaven. Deacons in a local church, elders will not necessarily enter into the kingdom of heaven because they said, Lord, Lord. He said, Master was his reference. And he's given a false allegiance here. He's showing that, well, I can call you master, but I wasn't faithful to you, is what he's saying. And begins to reap and gather. And what he's saying is this. He says, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. Now look, look what he's saying here. He, <clears throat> he says, reaping where you did not sow. By the way, if I went to somebody's garden, and it was not my garden, and they have prepared it, and they have planted it, and they have tomatoes and green beans and peppers. And I went and I took that food from that garden. That's what he's saying. He says, you're taking food where you did not sow, and you're gathering where you scattered no seed. He says, you're a thief. That's what he called the master. He said, you're a hard man. In fact, you're a thief. That's how he begins. He automatically takes the responsibility off of him. Is that not our society? Well, I, it wasn't my fault. It was such and such fault. It was such and such fault. He says, the reason that I handled the one talent the way that I did was because you're a thief. That's how he starts. Wow. Can you imagine the master being infuriated? So how does this reveal false allegiance? Number one, he produced nothing with the talent given to him. He had one talent. All he had to do was double that one talent. He had the ability. By the way, you know what? Yeah, he wasn't true allegiance. He wasn't truly faithful. But here's the question that I was thinking. But did he have the ability to double the one talent? Did he have the ability and the gifts 
to double the one talent? And the answer is yes. Why? Because the master is the one who gave it to him. You know what I find? Is that even unbelievers may not have the spiritual gifts because God's got to open those up when they receive. But even unbelievers, God has given them abilities to do certain things. Even those who do not trust in him, God has given them the function availability of, of, of running, acting, singing. He has given them those gifts. And not only that, he depreciated the character of his master by saying he was a hard man, he's a thief. So what does this slave represent? It's somebody who claims to know Jesus Christ, but are not using their gifts, and then judges God based on their perception of him. How many times where do you hear this? Well, I think God. Well, I think God would do this. Well, I think God would do this. Or I have my perception of God. Or you know what? Me and God, we have an understanding. You and God do not have an understanding. God has an understanding through his son, Jesus Christ, and him alone. And that is God's understanding. If you try to enter into heaven any way but that, you have no understanding with God. And so what he's saying here is that here's somebody who claims to be a faithful slave of the master. But you know what? I will not use the gifts and the talents. And not only that, I'm going to judge God based upon my own opinion. When you stand before the Lord, it will take about one second for your opinion to not matter any longer. Because you will know the truth then. Verse 25, and he said, I was afraid. Why? Because you're a hard man. You're a thief. I knew you would get on to me. I'm thinking, what's he going to get on to him about? He simply gave him one talent. He had the gifts and abilities to be able to have and, and, and answer for that amount of weight. What was he afraid? He was just simply blame shifting. He showed he wasn't faithful. And so he went away and he hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. He said, I was afraid. By the way, this was not a reverential fear of the master. But this is the bottom line. He's not worthy of my efforts. There's a, there's a fear that we should have of the Lord, and it's a reverential fear, and it's a God-fearing thing that we should have. But like we do our dad, you remember? Just that fear of, of your father, that you respect him, a fear of your mother, you respect him. But here's what he's doing, that my master is not worthy. You know what some people live their life as they're sitting on a pew, they never do anything, but thank God they're at church. Or they claim Christianity, but they never get up and do anything. You know what you're saying? God, you're just not worthy. You're not worthy. Even though you gave me the ability, the gifts, the talents, you're just not worthy for me to use them for you. He said, so I hid it. Now what we do? We hide it. We don't use it. So unbelievers... They're not even going to be able to deny that God has also given them certain abilities and talents. And so he hid it. He hid it. Verse 26, but his master answered and said, you one wicked slave. You're lazy. And you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where uh, I, I no seed. He said this, he said, you're wicked, he said, you're lazy. He says, he's revealing what the real slave is on the inside. And he's, what is he saying here? He said, you knew that I reap where I did not sow. The, the master is not saying, and saying, you know what, you caught me, I'm a thief. And what he's saying here, if you really thought that I'm stealing from other people, and if you really thought that I was a hard man, then why in the world would you take the one talent that I gave you and bury it and not try to at least double it, not try to get something for it? The master's not saying, yes, you're right, I, I am a hard man and I, and I do steal from other people. He, that's not what he's saying. If you thought that I was so hard, then why wouldn't you do something about it? And he turns his statement back on him. He's turning it back in his court where the slave had lied about him. He says, then, if you thought I was so hard, you should have took the money and you should have put it in the bank. 
And on my arrival, I would at least receive my money back with interest. If you thought I was such a terrible person, it would have been nothing but simple interest. That's all it would have been if you'd have taken the one talent and put it in the bank. And by the way, the bank system then, it was about to borrow, it was about 12% interest, like it was back in the 70s. 12% interest rate. And he says, you know what, if he would have got interest on that money, it probably would have been like 0.6%. But the question I have, would he have gotten something? And that's all he asked. Would he have gotten something back other than just turning it back in? But look what the slave said. The slave said, yeah, but you got your talent back. I mean, isn't that enough? And the master said, no, that's not enough. I wanted at least a simple interest. And that's what he's saying. I should have gotten 0.6% back. I should have got something back. Because why? I entrusted this to you and you were supposed to be faithful. For heaven's sake, you're one of my overseers. Therefore, what is it therefore, right? Because you are not real and you're not faithful to your master. Therefore, because of every conversation we just had, what am I going to do? I'm going to take this talent away from you. By the way, I'm going to take my talent away from you. Any gifts that will be given to you, I'm going to take it away. And I'm going to give it to the one with the most talent. Now, here, now you know me. If I don't know something, I'm going to search it out to the nth degree. And I don't know the answer to this question. The question is this. Why did he take the one talent from the unfaithful slave and give it to the one who had five talents? Why didn't he split it amongst the one with the two talents and the one with the five talents? And the answer that I have for you, I have no idea. I'm going to give you my personal opinion, and this is all it is. So if I'm wrong, I'm sorry. My personal opinion is that that slave that had five talents and, now, and then he doubled it and had 11, he took that one talent and gave it to him is because that particular slave could still handle more responsibility and the one with the two could not handle any more responsibility. That's all I know. That's all I have. And in, in, in the grand scheme of eternal, eternal, I don't know, okay? And so he took it and he gave it to the one with the five talents. And then he said in verse 29, For to everyone who has more shall be given to him, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have even what he does, you're going to have it taken away. So if you are not faithful, those who have will have more because of an act of faith and using what God has given you, he will bless you with more in the millennial kingdom. He said he's going to bless you with more. What that looks like, I don't think any of us understand that and what that looks like in, in heaven and overseers and all that stuff. I have no idea. I don't think anybody, we can guess. But we do know that it's going to be given more responsibility. And he says those who had it, you're going to have it taken away. Because what you're revealing is, I didn't have any faith in my life, I, and, I, 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 and I have unbelief in my life. Therefore, what happens? One will be taken, one will be left, you will be taken to hell. And so because they did not work, it's because of their unbelief. It's because of their lack of faith. Five of the virgins last week had oil, had the Holy Spirit from within. What this is, the kingdom, is the outward representation that they, he really was not a true faithful slave to this master. And, he, and then he looks at those that were around him, if it was guards or whatever, and he said this, throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness, into that place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. teeth. You know what he's saying? Into outer darkness. You know what? They are going to be thrown away since God is light. This man will be thrown away from the very presence of God there will be no God is being the light there will be no presence there and this slave is thrown into hell not because of he 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 didn't work his way to heaven he didn't give enough money it's because he is thrown into hell because he had no fruit 
and he had no genuine faith. And we see this in the book of James. James says this, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, faith without works is dead. James 2, But someone may say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works. And I will show you my faith by my works. You know what? This slave said, Yeah, that's my master. I'm faithful to him. He is my master. And then when he was given the one talent and be able to double it, he said, nope, I'm not working. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. And as a result, he's thrown into outer darkness. Question I have is, are you a freeloader? Are you freeloading thinking I can just sit back and do nothing? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian and I can go to concerts and sing about Jesus or hear people sing about Jesus and go to all these different things and sit in church all my life and do nothing. And not use the ability and gifts that God has given me and expect to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Are you just sitting back? Are you like the Thessalonians? Are you just sitting back waiting for Jesus to return? And you're sitting on your front step and saying and singing about heaven and I just can't wait to get there, but I'm really not going to do anything until he comes. He said, if you have no works, it reveals you have no true faith. And you're not faithful to the true master in what he's given you. Father, we love you today. We thank you for a very powerful truth. It's very clear what you're teaching here. When you tie the two stories together, those who had the Holy Spirit and those who are faithful will work. God, help us to be clear that just because we said a prayer when we were seven, and we're sitting here doing nothing. There's no evidence of any fruit in our life. Your word is clear to examine yourself to see if you're really, really in the faith. God, we need to have a balance. Sometimes I think we can work and work and work. And we forget get to look and look and look. We need to have the proper balance. We love you. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for those who put into work to sing and worship those who are operating everything to make all these services come together god thank you for your word and it is your truth you simply gave it to us to to preach thank you for that opportunity in jesus name amen god bless you pray you have a good day